Hi, my name is Dan Prine. I'm the pastor here at Edgewater United Methodist Church. Thank you so much for coming and checking out our website. We're so glad that you're here. Uh, it's my prayer for you that you have an opportunity to get a chance to come and, and experience what life is like here at Edgewater, to get a chance to, to, to connect with other people, but most importantly, to connect with God. We're kind of a come as you are kind of place. We meet in a, in a movie theater setting and, and we would really look forward to getting a chance to be uh, your church home. And so we hope to see you soon. And the one thing I do want to mention this morning is 
we all know it's almost Christmas. So Christmas Eve, we have three wonderful services here, and I would invite you to come and join at least one of them. It's a really special time here at the church. So let's get back to some praise and worship. Before we get back to praise and worship, we are so glad that you're here. So take some time, greet those around you, give each other an Edgewater welcome. I forgot that part. rejoice in your presence this morning, Lord. We thank you, God, for this amazing grace, this unfailing love that we sing about, that you would come down to this earth, you would humbly leave your rightful place on the throne and become man so that you can live and serve and love and die for us. We don't deserve that kind of love, we don't deserve that kind of grace, and we can't even comprehend it. 
So our only, uh, our only answer, the only thing that we are compelled to do, Lord, is worship you and rejoice. And may we sing your song over and over in our hearts and through our lives. And may we just rejoice in your strength, not in ours. May our song be about your love and not of our own. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God forever. we get in this mindset where we're, we're, we're just kind of singing words on a screen and, and it's all for God's glory because we want to sing to him. But I don't want us to forget that something very different is actually going on here when we sing these songs. Um, so it, it, that's true, but there's something as well. You see, a, a church, a gathering is meant to be many things. It's meant to be a hospital for the broken and the sick to come and be healed by the Holy Spirit. It's like a school, a place that we can come and learn from God's word. It's like a family where we can all gather and everyone is accepted. And it's also like a place that we gather and we get ready for war. And what I mean by that is this. In, in the really old days, you remember the movie Braveheart? Where are my men at? Come on. Yeah. Right? The movie Braveheart, that's like an awesome movie. It gets, like, it just gets you going, you know? And, 
And part of the, the thing behind it that was true in those really old times, armies would line up on a battlefield on both sides. They would just line up. And one side on the count of three, they would just start screaming at the top of their lungs. They would just start beating themselves and they were all painted and they were probably naked at the time. They were, they were just like barbaric. They were just screaming. And then the other side would do the same thing. And the reason they would do this, it wasn't just to amp themselves up, but it was to intimidate the people on the other side. Because see, the people on the other side, they saw the front line, but they didn't see the army that was behind them. So when they heard the roar of this army, then they knew, whoa, whoa, this is some serious stuff. These are some big, frightening people. They've got, they're huge. They've got so many people behind them, and it would intimidate the people on the other side. And the reason I'm saying this is because in worship, our songs of praise is like our battle cry on the battlefield. See, we have an enemy in this life. You have an enemy this morning, and he knows it's early, just like you know it's early. And he knows he can get you when you're tired, just like you know he can get you when you're tired. And see, what happens is when we come into a church and we start singing songs and we start singing glory to God forever, take my life and let it be all for you, what happens is these songs of worship, they start to get in the mind of the enemy, and he starts saying, whoa, I don't know. I didn't know they were that big. I didn't know they knew they had such a big power behind them. I didn't know they were that strong or they could be that loud. I have to rethink my strategy here. I might not be able to attack them like I was going to attack them. I might not be able to do what I was going to do because they know that there is a powerful force behind them. You hear what I'm saying? The enemy is here, and the more we sing and the more passionate we are about our God and about the strength of our Savior, the more our enemy is defeated. We're not just here to sing praises. We're also here to defeat the enemy before he even attacks. So come on, let's sing this out one more time, and let's sing it out like it's a battle cry, like our lives depend on it. Come on. Take my life and let it be all for you for your glory.
We are awestruck and filled with wonder at the sound and at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is higher, your name is greater than anything in this world. And we thank you, God, that you have come to save us. We thank you, Lord, that you are so filled with grace and mercy that you open your arms to us. God, we thank you in your word that it says you are near to the brokenhearted and that you heal a crushed spirit. And Lord, we are broken people this morning. And we thank you that because of your promise, we know that you are near to us. So Holy Spirit, help us to open up our hearts this morning because you are close, because you are here. We know that you can change us and you have the power to change us. We know that you can make us new. And Lord, this morning we want to boldly ask. We want to boldly ask for something great. We want to boldly ask that something that we didn't even think of, that we wanted or that our heart desired, God, that you would put a plan in our path, that you would put a future in front of our eyes that we didn't even know was there. We want something greater. We don't want you to hold back this morning, Lord. We want all of what you have in store for us. We want your freedom. We want your power. We want your strength. Not for our ease and not for our enjoyment, but God, for the furthering of your kingdom so that we can take this out of the doors into our city, into our homes, into this state, God, and that people can see a difference in us and we can point them to you. It's all for your glory that we're here. We have seen how you can heal. We've seen how you can change lives. We've witnessed your power and we want it, God. We want all of it. Because we know that your way is better. We know that your way is more peaceful. We know that your way is filled with joy. And we can't do this on our own, Lord. So Holy Spirit, mold us, make us, change us into a new creation. We are ready for it. We are your open vessels this morning, Lord. Keep our eyes and our hearts on you alone. We need you, God. So speak to us, Lord, as we listen for your voice. We thank you, and we can celebrate who you are. We can rejoice in your strength this morning. We are here by your grace alone. And we thank you, God, that you are here with us, and that means that anything can happen, and that's an exciting place to be. So we rejoice. We celebrate with all that we are because you're worth it. You're worth it and so much more. We love you in Jesus' name. And everybody set. Amen. Amen. Hey, God's not done. Amen. We still got some good stuff coming, so have a seat. Morning. So good to see all of you gathered here today. My name is Dan Prine. I'm the pastor here at Edgewater. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and be with us here. We are so glad that you're here. 
Uh, we are in week number three of our series uh, called Christmas is Forgiving, based on some teaching by Craig Grishel. Um If you were here over these last few weeks, uh, you, you may remember that in the first week of this series, we talked about how important it is for us to be able to go to those uh, that, that, that have hurt us and to be able to extend forgiveness. How can we forgive those who have hurt us? And then the next week, we looked at uh, the, the idea of initiating forgiveness, getting a chance to go to those that we have hurt. And, and asking for forgiveness. And today, as we wrap up this series, we're going to be talking a little bit about how can we forgive ourselves, or, and, and also how can we move beyond this hurt that we've experienced in our own lives as, as we receive forgiveness from God. So we're going to start off today in uh, the Gospel of Matthew. It's uh, the first book of the New Testament. Um, it, if you want to look it up in your Bible or on your phone, you want to follow along. Matthew chapter 1, verses 21 and 22 is going to be where we're going to start today. Where it says, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Now, as, we, as we're rolling on towards the end of this, this season, I mean, it's almost upon us. It seems like the month of December has just kind of flown by here. We're getting a chance to, to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ in just a couple of days here. It is a big spiritual time of year. Uh, it's one of the two high holy seasons that we celebrate in the church. It's also a big family time traditionally. Many of us, we go into these holidays and because it's so based in, in tradition and, and, and doing some of the same things over and over again, this is a time that we just naturally kind of reflect on the past. And a lot of times, the things that we reflect on, we remember good things. We, we remember a lot of good things that God has done in our lives. For others, though, this can be somewhat of a season of disappointment. And, and hurt and regret, and uh, as, as happens in a lot of holidays, pain has a tendency to surface during these times. In fact, someone said it this way, someone said, life is all fun and games till someone gets hurt. And, and we have a tendency to get hurt in life. We can experience sometimes very unexpected pain. As you talk to people in your life, you hear things like, hey, you know what? I thought we raised our kids better than this. I can't believe that we're having to go through this. What, what happened? Someone else might say, man, we had, a, we had a great year last year in our business, and then I made some really stupid decisions, and, and now we're barely making it from week to week. What happened? Someone might say, you know, I, ne I never thought that I would end up with a broken family, and then I'd be divorced. How did I get here? Some people would say, you know, I thought that by this time in life, that, that, that things would be different. I thought that life would be better by now. I, here I am at this age and this stage in life and, and, and here's where I am. I just thought things would be different. A lot of us carry a, a lot of pain, a lot of regret. So what we're going to do in our time together today is we're going to take the opportunity to look at how we can move forward beyond that pain and move into the blessings that God would have for us in our future. And a key verse to do this is found in, in 2 Corinthians. And in the section, the, the Bible talks to us about two different kinds of sorrow. There's godly sorrow and there's worldly sorrow. So let's take a look at this verse in 2 Corinthians 7.10. Where it says, For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. Okay, so, so you have this godly sorrow, you have this godly sorrow where you say, God, I'm, I'm sorry that, that I've hurt you, that, that I've done the things that I've done, and it leads to repentance, and it leads to salvation, and, and leaves no regret. But there's that other kind of sorrow, that worldly sorrow. And, and what does that worldly sorrow lead to? It leads to death, the scripture says. Where, where we say, oh, I'm, I'm sorry I did this. I'm sorry for how it's affecting me. And what happens a lot of times is it's, it's a very inward and, and depression-inducing kind of, of sorrow. And so what we're going to try to do today is we're going to try to move from this worldly sorrow to, to a godly sorrow, which leads to salvation and new life. So in order to do that, we're going to look at, at an Old Testament story of a, of a guy who, who had it all going for him. I mean, life was, was charting up and to the right all the time. And, and then he made a huge mistake. We're going to look at the story of the life of King David. King David was a king chosen by God. He was anointed by God's chosen messenger. And, and he just made a huge mistake. What did he do? If you remember the story, he had an adulterous affair with Bathsheba. You know the story? He got her pregnant and, and then found himself trapped. And he was like, man, what am I going to do? 
how am I going to get out of this? And so he, he, the, the army was at war at that time, and he sent word to have Uriah stationed on the front line of the battle lines and pretty much have everyone else go, whoop, and step back out of the way. So he was out there. So pretty much in, in putting forth that order, he was signing Uriah's death warrant. And so, so indirectly, he, he had him murdered. And so he lost his, his name, he lost his reputation, he lost his integrity, he ruined Bathsheba's name. She had this, this baby, and, and even there in the midst of all this, this pain and, and struggle that was going on, this little baby was born. But then if you know the story, you know that the baby got very sick, very, very sick. And, and David's heart broke for this little boy. And, and so what did David do? He sought after God. Okay, it says for seven days that he didn't eat. And he prayed, God, this isn't the boy's fault. This, this is my fault. Spare, spare him. And on the seventh day, he received the tragic news that the, the little boy died. And David carried this, this sense of guilt. He, he knew that he was the guilty one, and, and his guilt and his actions affected someone who was innocent. But God was still working in his life, and David had a choice to make in the middle of his pain. He, he could let this pain take him out and take him away from God, or he could let God use these hard times to soften his heart. And maybe even draw him closer to God than he had ever been before. So let's look at what David did to move forward through this scripture. He did three things, and that's what we're going to learn to do as well. On the back of your bulletin, there's a place you can write some of this down. I always encourage you to write some of these things down and take notes. It may not be right where you are today, but I'll tell you what. There are times that you're going to be shuffling through papers, and you're going through a struggle, and just the right thing at just the right time is going to pop up. God is cool like that. And so I just encourage you to just jot some of these things down. The first thing that we're going to learn to do today is this, is that we need to accept what cannot be changed. We need to accept what cannot be changed. The verse, in the verse that we're going to look at in just a second, King David's advisors came in to talk to him uh, after, the, the, after the boy died. And uh, let's look at 2 Samuel chapter 12, starting in verse 22. It says, David replied, I fasted and wept while the child was alive. For I said, perhaps the Lord will be gracious to me and let the child live. But why should I fast when he's dead? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him one day, but he cannot return to me. So what did David do? He accepted the fact that there was nothing that he could do to change what happened in the past. And I got to tell you that I, I know there's, there's some folks here today who need to hear that as well be able to embrace that truth that we cannot change that which is past some of you are you're, you're kind of locked in this mourning process you're you're maybe stuck in some ev events or situations that have happened in your past and you're kind of stuck there and and, and you're, you're you're mourning for something that cannot be changed and maybe god's loving word for you today maybe something along these lines that what you've lost is not coming back there, there's something that, that you wish could change, but it's in the past, and so it's not going to change. Before we can move forward, we have, to, we have to start by accepting that the things that are in the past cannot be changed. Sometimes we, we, we experience these things in our lives, and we, we hold on to them so tightly. Uh, they, these things, we continue to just carry them with us. There's a story about two monks that were traveling together, an older young monk and a younger monk. And uh, they came across this, uh, this really rough river, and there was a place where, where there's normally a passageway across, but it was, it was kind of swollen river, and the current was rushing. And there was a young lady on one side of the river, and she needed to get to the other side, but she couldn't. And, and as the monks were walking, the older monk saw the look in the younger monk's eye that he wanted to help, and he, he reminded him, he said, no, no, you can't do that. Remember, you can't let the skin of a woman touch you because it could cause you to have impure thoughts. But the younger monk just saw the woman in distress and went ahead and, and asked if he could help. And so he took her by the arm and, and steadied her as they walked across the river together, got her safely to the other side. When they got to the other side, the young lady said, thank you, thank you. And she threw her arms around his neck and gave him a kiss on the cheek to say thank you. And, and he, when he got back to the other side, the older monk looked at him with, with horror in his eyes. And he said, I can't believe you let that happen. The two monks continued on their journey. They walked for, for miles and miles and hours and hours, and the older monk was just too furious to even speak. And, and finally, after hours and miles of traveling, the older monk said, I cannot believe that you let the skin of that woman touch you. And the younger monk looked at the older monk and said, I let her go hours ago, but you're still carrying her in your heart. 
You know, there, there may be some things in your life that, that God's forgiven a long, long time ago, but you're still carrying it in your heart. In order to be able to move forward with God, the first thing that we have to do is we have to be able to accept that there are some things in our past that cannot be changed. Okay? The second thing that we have to do, we have to learn to do what David did, is that we have to learn to give it up to God. We have to give it up to God. Whatever the burden, whatever the guilt, whatever the regret, whatever the heaviness that we are carrying, we need to learn to give it over, to give it up to God. Let's look at 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 20. It says, Then David got up from the ground, washed himself, put on lotions, and changed his clothes. He went to the tabernacle and worshipped the Lord. After that, he returned to the palace and was served food and ate. So what did he do? He got up and went to church. He, he turned to the Lord. In the middle of his lowest time, he turned to God, and that's what we have to do as well. This is also the place that we learned that King David was a United Methodist because then he went and ate. So that's just how we roll. Um, so so in, 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 the, in the middle of his lowest time, he turned to God. In fact, there are three, three places that we can turn in the middle of our hurt. First of all, we can turn inward. We tend to do that a lot. We, we turn inward and we say, oh, I can't believe this happened. I feel so badly about this. I'm such a miserable person. We turn inward. The second place we can turn is outward. A lot of times we'll turn outward and we go, well, can you validate my existence for me? Can, can you please tell me that I'm not that bad a person? Can you tell me that my, that my clothes or my car or my house, that it helps to, 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 to make me okay? Will you please tell me that I fit in and maybe I'm not as bad as I think I am? Or, or if you can't do that, then, then move out of the way because I'm going to go find a smoke or a drink or a drug or something out there that can help to numb the pain and the hurt that I'm feeling. So we can turn outward, we can turn inward, or we can turn upward. We can turn toward God and God alone to be our source of strength and peace during times of pain. Because our God is a good God. He is a, he is a comforting God. The Bible says that God can bring us, uh, it, it describes it as a peace that passes understanding. A peace that is beyond anything we can understand. God stands ready to provide. So we have to learn, like, like David did, to, to give it over to God. In, in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, there, there's this verse that starts off this chapter. Let me read that for you, where it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, or it was in the year that King Uzziah died, that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Now, you may be thinking, well, what on earth does that mean? Well, let me, let me give you a little bit of context here, tell you how this fits. He, he opened up this chapter by saying, In the year that King Uzziah died. Now, what was he saying? Basically, he was saying, you know, in, in the year that my whole world fell apart. That's what he was saying. You know, in, in, that, in that year where everything was once stable and it's now unstable. He could have said it that way. Maybe he could have said on September 11th, year 2001. Or he could have said in the year that Hurricane Charlie came. Or in, in the year that the person that I love passed from this life to the next. He could have said, in, in the year that, that my loved one walked out on me, in the year that my business fell apart, in the year that I did something so stupid that I consciously stepped into sin that destroyed my life and hurt other people. On, on, in the year that my world fell apart, what does it say? It says, I saw the Lord. In the year where nothing made sense, I still experienced the presence of God. I, I saw him on this lofty throne. I saw him high and lifted up. His, his power and his presence and his peace was enough to sustain me and keep me going when everything else was, was shaking apart. Some of you who are here this weekend, you need to hear that. You need to embrace that fact that the past is not going to change. And that we have to take our burden, our, our heaviness, our guilt, our regret, whatever it is that we're dealing with, and be able to give it up to God. The third thing that we have to do in order to move forward is this. Just like David, we need to learn to focus on what is left, not what is lost. To focus on what is left, not what is lost. Check this out. David, King David, he messed up big time. 
Okay? He sinned and got Bathsheba pregnant and the baby died because of David's guilt. And in this next verse, we see this amazing verse filled with grace in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 24. Where it says, then David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and slept with her. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son, and they named him Solomon. The Lord loved the child. What do, what do we see in that? Could, could God ever replace that son that was lost? No. Could, could the pain and loss of that first child ever really fully, completely go away? I don't think it does. But what did God do? God didn't change the past. But God brought something new. Our spiritual enemy that Will was talking about earlier, our spiritual enemy wants us, that's one of his tools, he wants us to look over our shoulders. He wants us to look in the past. He wants us to be chained by these things that have held us back for so long. But remember, we can't be stuck in the past. We can't be stuck looking back. Remember how the Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians. He said, I'm forgetting what's behind and I'm pressing on towards what is ahead. The problem with so many of us is we tend to, to remember the things we should forget and forget the things that we should remember. And, and so we go back in the past and we dredge up these things and we, and we kind of hold them in our hands and we, we, we turn them over and over and over again. And, I, and, and we, we bring up all that old pain and I just really think that God would, would say to us this morning, hey, stop doing that. I forgave that years ago. Why, why do you go back and dig up the pain again? We, we, we sometimes forget these healing promises of God. Those of you who are carrying pain and guilt and regret, and you wonder, you know, will life ever go back to normal? Check it out. The past cannot be changed, but the meaning of the past can be changed. We, we can never change what happened, but God can change the meaning of the past. He, he can bring redemption and restoration if we will allow him. The college football bowl season started this week, and uh, I love watching as many of those games as I can pack in. There's always one on. It seems like every day from now till like way down the road, and uh, and I love it. And there was a, a particular game back in 1929. It was the Rose Bowl, and it was it was kind of cool because I, I preached about it last service, and then uh, Derek came up and said, "Look, I, I found footage." And so he like found footage of this game back in 1929. Let's see, can we, can we uh, even like with the newsreel uh, audio behind it. Sorry, did I catch you by surprise there? Okay, well, we'll come up with that in a second. Let me, let me give you a little background here. It was, it was the Rose Bowl in 1929. It was the University of Georgia against Cal. Okay, and then there was a Cal player named Roy Regals. He was a defensive player who made this incredible hit, knocked this guy, and, and, and the ball came loose, and, and Regals picked up the ball, and he was kind of a little bit disoriented from the hit. And, and instead of, of, of running towards the end zone that he was supposed to go, he ran the other way. So let's take a look at, uh, at this. Super for all time. How about the most famous case of misdirection in the history of football? Wrong way, Roy Regal. Retrieves a fumble, then rockets 60 yards to the end zone. Roy, great play, wrong way. So, so what happened is, and so, so his coach was, was screaming, no, turn around, and, and, and the other team was going, go Regals, go Regals, and, and that, was, that was his own player that was chasing him down, and they finally tackled him at like the two-yard line, his own team. And so, um, and of course, they, they, they couldn't do anything with the ball there, and they ended up, the other team ended up scoring, so they went into halftime, and, and Regals, of course, was just demoralized. I mean, he, he had his, his helmet on and, and, and he was just in the corner kind of bawling his eyes out because he just knew that he had lost the Rose Bowl for his team. And, and as the coach was getting done with the, talking at halftime, he, 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 Regals was still feeling like he was like the laughing stock. I mean, even there, wrong way Regals, that he was, the, he was the, the laughing stock of football. He had let his coach and his team and his university down. And then the coach got ready, finished the halftime talking, and, and, and he, he said, all right, all of you who started the first half, get back on the field to start the second half. Well, Regal started the first half, but, but everyone else went out on the field, and he just stayed there at, a, at his locker, just head in his hands. And the coach walked up and said, Regals, didn't you hear what I told you? Everyone who started the first half, did you start the first half? And he said, yeah. And, and it, but he, 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 his face was still kind of numb from, from the tears. And he said, Coach, I can never go back out there. 
I'm a laughing stock of football. I'm embarrassed. I, I, I bet I've lost the game for us. And the coach reached down, grabbed him by the shoulder pads and pulled him up and looked him in the eye and said, Regals, you are my player. You made a mistake. You are forgiven. Now get out there and win the game. And, and the reports that came from that game was, was that Roy Regals played the second half like a man possessed. He was all over the field, not any, anybody who had the ball, knocking him over, just, just hitting everybody. And, and, and he, he, he was so inspired, he was, he was on a mission, and he led his team to a substantial victory. Why did he do that? How could he do that? What, what was the change in that moment from defeat into a moment of victory? What was it that brought about that change? Where did it come from? It came from two things. The first thing it came from was forgiveness. It came from forgiveness. He was forgiven. The second thing that it came from was a second chance. So it came from forgiveness and a second chance. Why did Jesus come? Why, why are we celebrating this season? Well, the angel came. We read that verse earlier. The angel came and said to give him the name Jesus. The Lord saves, which means he will save the people from, his, from their sins. Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, but to do what? To save it. Look at what Isaiah said. Isaiah said this in, in uh, Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. He said, but forget all that. It, it's nothing compared to what I'm going to do. For I'm about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I'll make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. What is God saying there? He's saying he's going to do something new. That he's doing something different. So don't dwell on the past. You, you, you've got to let that go. This is, this is a new day. As we get ready to head into 2015, I'm sure there's some of you that are ready to ball up and tear up and burn the 2014 calendar. But there's just some stuff you just cannot wait for, the, for this new, new year to start. And you know what? As this new year approaches, I want to encourage you to, to grab it with the spiritual new birth of the risen Christ. Who says, I forgive and I give you a second chance. When you realize that you have this opportunity for this fresh start to play the second half, that you can still win in bringing glory to God, you will play with a passion and fire in your eye. Have you messed up in the past? Well, join the stinking club. Amen, brother. There you go. So you don't have to die there, though. Don't die there. Don't stay chained to it. Godly sorrow leads to life. Worldly sorrow leads to death. Now, now one thing that you may or not, may not know, I'm sure there are some of you who are probably thinking, why, why is he preaching about David? Here it is, the Sunday before Christmas. What on earth does that story have to do with Christmas? I bet it doesn't have anything to do with Christmas. Well, not so fast, my friend. It does. Because I'll tell you what, if you go back to the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, you know how it starts, and, and sometimes you read, and it starts with the genealogy, and it just lists all of the ancestors of, of Jesus. And sometimes you get going through, and you get to six or seven names that you can't pronounce, and you just go, I'll just skip down to where it says Jesus. And you start there. Well, but sometimes when we do that, we miss something that's in the midst of all of that. And, and it's kind of hidden there in Matthew chapter 1, verse 6, where it says, Jesse was the father of who? And David was the father of who? Whose mother was who? Bathsheba, the widow of Uriah. So right there in the midst of tracing this lineage of the life of Jesus flowing down through all of these people is this darkest spot of David's life put right there in black and white on the page. This, this, this place where, where he had just totally messed up, had totally blown it. And, and, and yet... Here it was. It's listed right there in tracing Jesus' line. The story of David's fall, but not just that, but God's restoration. God's redemption. And so with that thought in mind, let's jump back to the verse that we started with in Matthew chapter 1, 21 and 22. Where it says, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. It says all of this. Let me hear you say all of this. All of this happened, including David's darkest point in his life, because it allowed God to show how great he was in the ability to restore and renew. It, all of that took place to fulfill what the Lord said through his prophet. This is the work of an amazing God who forgives sin 
provides second chances. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for uh, the grace that you pour out into our lives, that um, for all the times that we, that we mess up, for all the times that we fall short, God, for all the sin in our lives, that, that you are willing to forgive, that you are willing to give us a fresh start. And so God, if there's anyone here today who is, is still kind of stuck in those things of the past, still holding on to the, the hurt and the pain, continually looking back and not pressing forward, God, I pray that today you would you'd just help them to be able to do a, a 180 and turn and look in the direction of, of what you have in store for them. Because God, as long as we are sucking down oxygen on this planet, you are not finished with us yet. You have not written our last chapter. And God, you are the author of life. And I thank you for that. I thank you that you write the, the story and that you call us a masterpiece. So God, I pray that you help us to be able to, to move forward, trusting you, listening to you, hearing from you. God, I thank you that you give second chances. I can't speak for anybody else, but I know I need them every day. God, I thank you that you are gracious enough, even though I don't deserve it, even though there's no way I could ever earn it, that you give us these second chances, that you forgive and give us a fresh start. Maybe you're here today and, and you've never experienced that fresh start for yourself. Maybe you've never turned your heart over to God and said, God, you know, I'm sorry for the things that I've done. Please forgive me. Give me that second chance. Well, we want to give you the opportunity to do that today. The way that we do it is we just say a little prayer. There's nothing magical about these words at all. These words just kind of help us get focused, help us to maybe clarify the things that are bouncing around in our brains, in our hearts. And so I'm going to pray this prayer, and I want you to repeat it after me out loud. You're not going to be doing it alone because we all need forgiveness. We all need a second chance. And so we're all going to be praying this prayer. So I, I invite you to repeat after me and pray, Heavenly Father, please forgive me of my sins. Make me brand new. I believe Jesus died for me. And he rose again. So I could live for you. Fill me with your spirit. So I could follow you. All the days of my life. Thank you for new life. I give you mine. In Jesus name. Amen. Let's give glory to this God of second chances. This God who forgives. Gives us a fresh start. If you prayed that prayer for the first time today, we are so excited for you. We know that there's a party going on in heaven over this new life that has begun. If you did pray that prayer for the first time, either during this last song or after the service, please be sure to stop by our yes table in the back corner of the worship center. Uh, we've got a Bible and some other materials we'd like to give you to help you to get connected to God um, and get started on that journey. We're going to sing one last song here, uh, kind of uh, just opening ourselves, allowing God to bring about a sense of, of healing in us from these hurts in our past. If, if you would like to come and spend some time in prayer at the altars on either side, you're welcome to do that. Or if you'd like someone to pray with you, we, we have folks stationed along the walls who would love to do that. Maybe you do have some healing needs, emotional, maybe even physical healing needs. We have folks who would love to pray for you along those lines for your healing. So as we, uh, let's just take some time now and just lift our hearts up to God in prayer.
today, go entrusting your life to the healer, the one who heals us from our hurt, from our disease, from our struggles, the one who wants to come and set you free from those things in the past that cannot be changed. And so give it over to God and focus not on, on, on what's lost, but on what he has ahead of you because God created you and he loves you and he has a plan for your life. So walk with him, trust him, follow him, go in his name. Amen. Have a Merry Christmas. We'll see you next week.